once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for that rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Nameless here, forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me. Filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Uh, sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dare to dream before. But the silence was unbroken and the stillness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word. This I whispered and an echo murmured back to me the word, no, merely this and nothing more. Back into the chamber, turning all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I heard the tapping somewhat louder than before. <laughs> surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what Therat this is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here, I flung the shutter, when with many flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven from the saintly days of yore, not the least obe obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with men of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a busted polish just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. <laughs> then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the, the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, to tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever lived yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door upon a sculptured bust just above his chamber door, bird or beast above his chamber door, upon a sculptured bust just above his chamber door with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on that placid bus spoke only that one word. As if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore.
startled at the stillness, broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is only, it's only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs of one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. <laughs> but, but the raven, still beguiling, all my sad soul into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. And upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. <laughs> this I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press. Ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumes from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee respite, respite, and nepenthe the from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind of penthe, and forget the lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still is bird or devil. Whether temper sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a, a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word a sign of parting bird or fiend? I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave me no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness and broken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven. Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust of Paula's just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. That's it. <laughs> okay. Wow. What a poem. Like I said, it may be one of the most beautifully written, one of the most perfect poems ever written. And really what I'd like to do now, I know it's cliche. <clears throat> I know you've heard it your whole life. I know that um, this is not your first rodeo when it comes to this poem, but I bet, I bet after we're finished with it today, you'll have a completely different <laughs> appreciation of it. So let's start at the very beginning. The raven. What is a raven? A raven is a grackle kind of bird, sort of a grackle. Um, a raven now, uh, gosh, when I first started studying this poem a lot of years ago, 
the raven really wasn't a, a bird. It was more like a mythical bird. But now they have the North American raven and various various birds that they have kind of assigned, names that they have assigned to that, to that bird. In any event, it's a pitch black bird. And what color eyes do they have? Yellow, piercing yellow, beady eyes, piercing yellow eyes. And this is the kind of bird with a big breast, <laughs> you know, big old breast that sticks out. And you've seen them. You've seen all the grackles. Here we are in, in Texas, and we have these North American grackle. And it is, I mean, we have thousands of them. I dare say millions of them. And so when you see them on the ground, especially uh, when they puff their feathers up, you, look, you can look into their ebony feathers and you can see this dark shimmery feeling, this dark shimmery kind of sheen. It's almost as if the raven or the grackle is so black, you see into it, through it to another world kind of in that sheen, that strange purple iridescent ish kind of sheen. Now, what is, what's occurring here? It, clearly, Edgar Allan Poe, we'll talk deeply about Edgar Allan Poe, we'll talk deeply about the dark romantics, but I don't think if you knew Edgar Allan Poe, you'd like it. <laughs> I don't think you'd like it. I mean, um, this, this, uh, <clears throat> he was su su supremely depressed, and I also think he was OCD. I can read into a lot of his a lot of his uh, writings, and he really, especially the House of Usher, he he describes OCD to a T. Um, in any event, Edgar Allan Poe, of course, it, it, he his history goes something like this: His mother died when he was quite young. Okay, one of the things that people don't know about, like here's Edgar Allan Poe. This is the this is the most famous po uh, pitch image of him in all the images. He he. Just a few days before that, now everyone knows, everyone knows if you want your girlfriend to come back, you know, she's left you, all you got to do is cook uh, fake suicide, right? Or, or, or <laughs> I'm joking, I'm kidding, shouldn't be joking about that. But nonetheless, Edgar Allan Poe faked suicide from an overdose of laudanum just a few days before this. And I wonder, you know, if he had known that that picture would be the one that would be on every school English class's <laughs> you know, wall from now until the end of time that he would have smiled or something? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. So anyway, one of the things that happened when he was young, now we need to talk about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is this incredibly terrible disease that a lot of our authors, Henry David Thoreau died from it, Doc Holliday died from it. Many, many people during this time period died from TB, tuberculosis TB. And it is a coughing sickness. It's a lung sickness. This is where you cough up blood. Now, I make a lot about the power of women, the, the, the importance of mother in life. I mean, mother, think about mother. When you wake up into this world and you look up into the eyes of that of your mother, it's usually your mom the first time, right? Usually. Um, it's like beholding the face of God. It's that powerful. And the love that you feel, the love and the bond between mother and child is, is, not, is, is not found anywhere else, I don't think. I mean, daddies are good, but mama's mama, right? Imagine you watching your mother die slowly and painfully, coughing up blood, <laughs> you know, just, just basically suffocate. What happens is you're the, the blood and mucus and all kinds of junk seeps from your body into your lungs and you slowly drown on your own blood. And you cough up this blood and it's just, it's a bloody, horrible, bloody death. Now imagine what that would do to, your, do to you as a child. Yeah. Not only that, but then he fell in love with his uh, one of his friend's mothers. Not a lot of people know this. He fell in love with one of his friend's mothers. <laughs> and, uh, and this is when he was very young, very young. And uh, she died of brain cancer. OK. And then, of course, now I, we have to understand that I, I, we're not going to condone this kind of thing. And. Um, when you're 13 years old, you cannot consent. 
to sex or anything else. But here's Virginia Clem. Virginia Clem was his uh, cousin. She was 13. And they got married and they changed her age to, they were first cousins, blood relatives, and uh, changed her name, changed her age to 21. Now, I want to make sure you understand that I do not condone. I mean, 13 is, is too young. It's just too young. It's just, you can't, you can't consent when you're 13. She had little, little agency over her life and, and uh, she was married off to this depressive man. Now, but that being said, that being said, by all accounts, they had whatever you could say would be a good relationship under that circumstance. They had it. He, re he really loved her. And there are stories of them playing leapfrog in the park and cut. And I'd say, I mean, it's great. I shouldn't say it like this, but cousin Eddie split his pants, you know, playing. Well, I mean, okay, I understand. But nonetheless, he, he, at least he, I can't speak for her, but he truly loved her, truly. Once and for all, she was the one. She was the one who would be with him always. He was... He was, if nothing else, just a just a poor lost soul that just was wanting, reaching out. I think of him kind of like, have you ever had a puppy or a kitten who has been weaned from their mother too early and the lifelong trouble that that causes them? It's like that. Screws them up forever. I, I think of him like that. And all he wanted was just this one person. Well, I understand. She's 13. That was rape. I get it. But he really loved her. And then what? One day she had this beautiful soprano voice. And one night she was singing, you know, she was singing and she just coughed a little bit and a little bit of blood, a little bit of blood showed up just on her lip there. Ho knew. He knew exactly what that was. And he knew exactly the fate that lay before her and him and so <clears throat> she was going to die of tuberculosis of course and so she would die a slow death a horrible death and she would die presumably in this cottage you can see this cottage right here <clears throat> But the worst part about it is she would get better and worse, better and worse, better and worse. And each time she got better and worse and better and worse. This is uh, nobody really knows where he wrote the Raven or if it was multiple places. But between these two places here, indeed, that's where he was in the other room writing the Raven, rehearsing her death. And each time she got better, he got he 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 allowed himself to hope. And then each time she went got bad again, he prepared himself for her death. And so PTSD comes into it now as well. Imagine getting getting your hopes up and then going to, and that happened like a sine wave over and over and over again until finally she died. That is where we're coming from with the raven, right? And so here we have, in the beginning of the raven, we have a student. We, he has been thought of as either a student or a scholar of some kind. I think of him kind of like a student because a chamber, what is a chamber anyway? Um, Edgar Allan Poe himself was a student. And uh, for a while, and he was so poor, his his foster his foster father, Alan, he um, would not pay for Poe's tuition, and so Poe was so poor that Poe had to burn the furniture in his dorm room for warmth during the winter. But he painted all over the walls, and at that point in his life, people weren't sure whether Poe would be a great poet or a great artist. The man was just dripping with creativity, right? But here we have a, a student or maybe a scholar, and it's midnight. What happens at midnight? Midnight's the witching hour, man. 
Midnight's the time when uh, the witches come out. Yeah, midnight is the time when uh, the ghouls and goblins and demons come out. Yeah. Now, we know this. This is, this is settled. But then, what does it sound like when, uh, when maybe you, uh, maybe you, uh, oh gosh, I know this is a stupid analogy, but if you're playing one of those g games like a, uh, uh, Fortnite or, or something like that, Halo, and a bomb goes off. It's this whoa, 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 whoa. It's this slow motion. I've seen, I've, you maybe have felt it in real life. If, uh, if you've been in a car wreck, I remember my really bad car wreck. It was like, you know, you, it just a slow motion. I could feel myself hit the pavement and then I could feel the, you know, the, the, the glass slowly tink, tinkling to the, and then it's like this, this, whoa, whoa. or maybe if you're falling asleep, it's this, whoa, 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 whoa. it's this W, whoa, 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 whoa. So here he is, it's at midnight. And while I pondered weak and weary, whoa, 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 whoa. So he's falling asleep with those W's that whoa, 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 right? The wah -wahs. And so with W, it's alliteration, while I pondered weak and weary. And then over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Well, what is lore but mythology? And mythology is not, I mean, you ever read any mythology? It's not like happy stories. <laughs> it's pretty dark, demonic type of stuff that's happening with dragons and, and gods uh, killing each other and, and impre you know, impregnating, you know, like Zeus coming and disguising himself as a swan and impregnating Leda. Oh, gosh, it's crazy stuff. And so here he is at night, at midnight, studying lore. Folk tales. Mythology. While I nodded, nearly napping, the ends, no, 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 no. And it's almost, if you were to say, um, uh, why? Why is he trying not to fall asleep? Why? Because presumably, as soon as he, I don't, I'll, I don't mind, you know, revealing to you that I have this girlfriend from way a long time ago, and she, she's the villain of my dreams. I don't know. She's the villain. Whatever story I have, she shows up as the villain. It's insane. But in any event, he, as soon as he goes to sleep, he will dream of her, of Lenore. And it will be horrible. So he doesn't want to go to sleep. He's trying very hard to attend to this mythology or this lore that he's, that he's reading. And it's almost as he's nodding, That's like, no, 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 I don't want to, no, don't go to sleep. No, 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 no. And so here's the difference between alliteration and good alliteration. When you can make your alliteration sound like the thing that you're describing, that is, that's an economy. It gives you a more bang for your buck, right? No, 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 no. And then someone, there's a tapping at the chamber door, nearly napping. Suddenly there came a tapping. Tis some, now he's trying to put, oh, to, now, I mean, just be honest. You're midnight, you're at midnight. You've had your, you've had this terrible loss in your life and you're sitting there trying to read this stuff. And, and you hear this. That's freaky. You know, cause how do people not? Hello, oh, what's going on? And hey, not that, but this is that means it's just freaky. You're just sort of like it's a tapping. It's not really a knocking. It's just, a, I mean, it's freaky. You have to admit that's freaking freaky. And most Americans would get your guns and be like, "All right, here's your time." <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so, and then he tries to tell himself, it is some, some late visitor entreating entrance of my chamber door, you know, <clears throat> now, ah, distinctly I remember it was the bleak December. 
and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Okay, wow, December, amazing. And, and, and uh, December is the Yule, t December, um, why does it have to be December? Because believe it or not, December is the month of many, many, many pagan holidays. Also, it is presumably the coldest time. It's December. December, what happens in the, in the, in the uh, winter? Everything dies. Everything's dead. It's the bleak December. And each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Yeah. So now we've evoked ghosts. And what are, what are embers? Wow. They are slowly burning pieces of wood or coal. And they have, they have, if you've seen a dying fire, his whole world is dying. Everything he knows is dying. His world, his mind, his life, his soul, his spirit, his happiness, his love, Lenore, is all dead or dying. Everything outside is dead or dying. And the fire, the last vestige, the last kernel of hope is the fire. And it's dying too. But not only that, but it it is it is sending its shadows. Now the shadows, when the when the fire gets to be really low, it's going to lengthen out the shadows, and each one of those shadows is like its own separate ghost upon the floor. Winter solstice is in December. Um, uh, there's several non-Christian gods before Jesus, Addis, Dionysus, Osiris, and Mithra. All these have their birthdays in, De in December. And this is the Yule. Yeah, many pagan holidays. Yeah. The dying embers foreshadows the death of the woman. They're dying. He's dying. All, all is dying. Now, he says, eagerly, I wish tomorrow. <clears throat> Eagerly, I wish tomorrow. Oh, all, all I wanted was just tomorrow to come. Just bring it on tomorrow. I, tomorrow in the natural sun, I'll quote, I'll quote Melville. On the morrow in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames on the morn will show, at least in a gentler relief, the glorious, golden, glad sun, the one true lamp, all others but liars. So tomorrow, 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 and tomorrow, that's what I, I need. Just come to the sun for tomorrow. I will feel better tomorrow. If I can just read this and not go to sleep, and then when the sun comes out, I'll be okay. And I'll be able to, from my books, I will receive surcease of sorrow. The sorrow that I feel from, lost, from my lost Lenore, I'll be able to cease it for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Why, why do the angels name her, her Lenore? Because she's in heaven. The angels name her. They call her. Lenore. Hey, Lenore. How you doing today? We're in heaven. How's it going? You play your harp today. But for the rare and radiant, more alliteration, rah, 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 rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Nameless here. Why is she nameless here? Because she's dead. She's gone. She's nameless here for evermore. And then we have this. The silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain. So this is another example of great alliteration. You can feel it as if a ghost walked in front of the curtains. There's a little rustling, rustling. You feel that rustling. Silken, sad, uncertain. And that's called sibilance. It's alliteration using S as sibilance. And why are they, why are they purple? Oh gosh, it just wouldn't do it for any other any other color. Just wouldn't do, would it? Couldn't hardly say black. But purple is like a darker black, right? Remember what I said when you looked into the ebony feathers of the of the raven, you see that purple sheen. But also, purple is the sign of um, is the is the uh, is color of kings and queens. In fact, purple was so incredibly uh, expensive that. There was only one way to get it, and it was from the inter in internal 
uh, ladder of a mop of a uh, like a clam and they would have to break the clams up. It's very, very hard to make before we had synthetic dyes. The silk and satin, certain rustling, uh, they, the, perp, the curtains are rustling, filled me with fantastic terrors. Now I wanna make a big deal out of this because the, the dark romantics are seeking this thing called the sublime. And the sublime, is is a very not very cool band you know but also it's it's a uh, the sublime is that which inspires awe and i, I want to make as big of a deal out of this as i can because the the sublime is like standing in the middle of a war mortar mortar shells are going off all around you you know and you know you're being you can hear i've heard it you can hear the, the, the hollow sound of the bullets whizzing by you. It's, it's like a, I can't even explain that sound, but you know, it's like a, just a hollowed out sound. And, and you just, and, and, and you know, you can boom, boom. And then maybe something horrible happens to one of your friends or whatever. This is a moment of sublimity. It is not sublime. The sublime doesn't have to be good. It can be awful, but it inspires awe. Maybe at the end of a fireworks display, you look up and literally think about this word, uh, so, uh, this word awe. Literally, you say, oh, 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 man. You see a bad car wreck. Oh, right. You literally say, make the sound. Oh, if somebody punches you in the stomach. Oh, right. But more than that, stand in front of a huge waterfall and you realize you realize you're 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 tiny, you're so tiny. When you look up at night into that steep, wonderful sky, you're out on a Girl Scout trip. And you look up there into the Milky Way and you say, Oh. When you start to think of does the universe have corners? Does it have an edge? Oh, when you start to realize when someone finally tells you that the galaxies of our of our universe are flying apart and they're accelerating. Wait, what? Yeah, they're accelerating as they fly apart. You go, oh, <laughs> so these dark romantics are in search of the sublime, the awe. I want to give it to you one other way. And I'll, and I'll tell you this again. Think of yourself. No, I'm not, I don't want to hunt whales. I'm not a whale hunter. I'm a, I'm a conservationist. But imagine yourself, 17th century, 18th century, out on the Pacific Ocean. There's no Coast Guard. You're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Around you are islands can, uh, inhabited by cannibals. The Marquesas Islands, the Cook, whatever. There's no, there's no Coast Guard, there's no helicopters. You're on a little wooden ship and you are in a little tiny boat and you are out doing battle against sperm whales, against these leviathans, these leviathans of the deep, dark ocean. They exist in a world where you'll never go, where you can't go, where you can't know. They might as well be from outer space. And the whale comes reaching up and... <sighs> And the wave comes and here you are, you, here you are swirling in the eddies and the, and the, the sperm whale's jaw is you know, chopping your friends in two and taking limbs and there's blood in the water and oars and everything else. That's sublime. But here we have it. We are, we are with the raven here. And that sublimity is seen in these silken, sad, uncertain and that's why he says, they thrilled me. They filled me with fantastic terrors. Not just horrible terrors, but fantastic terrors. Fantastic. Never felt before. And so still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating to some, yeah, he's like, he's trying to convince himself. You, you've done this a thousand times. You ever hear a sound at night? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, you're just like, ah, oh, come on. Just go back to sleep. You're being stupid, come on. Come on, there's nothing out there. And then again. Oh, it's nothing. 
<laughs> right? Right? You've been there. So he's trying to, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to wrap, he's trying to uh, uh, explain it all away. And then this, my dear, wonderful students, I want you to key in on this as much as you possibly can. I think these are the most haunting lines ever written, ever written, ever in any poem or any piece. And it goes like this. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there and nothing more. The door, of course, is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the door between this world and the next. What is the ultimate meaning of it all? What does life mean? What happens after death? Who are we? Do we have some purpose here? Do we have fate? Do we have fill in the blaze? Is there God? Is there eternal punishment and eternal reward? Is there heaven? Whatever. Is there a meaning to it all? Does anything happen after death? Now, most people, most people would open that door a little bit. and just peer through, not Poe. Oh. Just burst. Open here, open, here I open wide the door. And what was there? Darkness there and nothing more. He opened his mind to the possibility of the universe and saw nothing but darkness, emptiness. What is darkness? It's emptiness, infinity. At least with lightness, there is some hope of putting an object in there. If you walked into a white room, like, okay, let's put some furniture in here. But darkness is all enveloping. There's nothing there. So what he's saying here is I opened the door to the universe and saw nothing but oblivion. And that to most people is the scariest thing of all. When you die, nothing happens. Just dark. Oblivion for eternity. And then not only that, but here, not that he just opened it up a little bit and shut it and said, oh my God, no. He burst himself. Oh. Deep into that darkness, peering long, I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dare to dream before. Woohoo! Deep into that darkness, peering long, I stood there wondering, fearing. See those, all those Ds? Deep into that darkness, peering long, I stood there wondering. It's his heart. As he's peering into that darkness, he opens it and, and, and long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dare to dream before. But the silence was unbroken and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word. I know. He literally leaned into the darkness and he says, is that you, Lenore? Actually, call is it is it Lenore? Maybe it's her ghost. Maybe she's come back to be with me, Lenore. But what happens? This is the beauty of this poem, the perfectness, the, the perfection of this poem. He he whispers, Lenore. And a whispered, um, an echo murmured back to him the word Lenore. This is the proverbial echo chamber. There's nothing there. It's empty. Lenore. Does Lenore show up and say, hi, I'm here to help you? No, 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 no. It is the, the whisper. It's just, he just hears himself. I know. Merely this, nothing more. Oh, God. Okay. As if it's not depressing enough, by there. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I heard the tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what therat this is and this mystery explorer. Let my heart be still. He even references his heart that was beating up here with the deep into the dark. Do -dum, do -dum, do -dum, do -dum, do -dum. 
let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. And he's trying to explain it away. It is the wind and nothing more. Now here, open here, I flung the shutter. Wind with many a flirt and flutter. Flung the shutter, flirt and flutter. What does flutter sound like? Sound like a bad word, right? Right, you know, I mean, you, what, does a, what does a bird sound like when it gets in? All the, so first of all, you can hear him come in. I flung the shutter with, with many flirt and flutter. But also, maybe you can do word association. It sounds like the F word. Or if somebody, you know, somebody, you get real mad. In there stepped a stately raven from the saintly days of yore. These are like from the, from the, this is the idea of Gothic literature. The Gothic is hearkening back to the times of when, and, and it's, it's a misnomer. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ill-conceived idea because the the notion goes like this that in the past things really made sense during medieval times you know during the medieval times when we had knights in shining armor and damsels in distress and that's when we really had it all worked out and now it's gone and and gothic literature is this is this an endeavor to show after the decay of those times of yore those times of meaning well in reality the medieval time period you would not want to live in <laughs> you know, not yeah feudalism that was really good yeah i remember that mm, that's great but in any event in our goth in the, the gothic tradition that was the good time with the castles and and lords and ladies and now it is all decayed and those castles are inhabited by ghosts and ghouls and goblins and that's where he thinks maybe this raven is from oh from the saintly days of yore, from the good old days. Here's the raven, he's a stately raven. Why is he stately? Because you ever seen a raven? Right? <laughs> and with those eyes, they just pierce into your soul, don't they? A stately raven from the saintly days of yore, not the least obeisance. What's an obeisance now? If you are, if you were a king, if you were, if you were presenting yourself to the king or queen, if you're a lady, you do a curtsy, curtsy. If you're a man, you would, you know, in our regular life, an obeisance would be if you walk in, you say hi to the boss. Hi, how are you doing, sir? Good to see you. That's an obeisance. It just shows that you don't think you're John Wayne. Not the least obeisance made he. Not a minute stopped or stayed he. But with men of lord or lady, this is the, the, uh, the uh, kind of the ostentatious demeanor, the demeanor of a lord or a lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bus of palas just above my chamber door. Look at those, the peas perched above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Ah, okay. Now, I, I need you to, feel that I need you to hear this it is um it is a bus of Pallas who is Pallas Pallas is Athena which would be the goddess of wisdom and uh this is a long idea but basically this is a bird that steps in stand by this is a bird that steps in Athena is the Greek goddess of wisdom, among other things. The raven has come in and sat on the top of a pallid, a white bust. It's a statue from here up of Athena. And Athena is the goddess of wisdom. Oh, okay. All right. But now you have to think of why is a raven... Why is it a raven and how perfect? Raven is a prophet. A raven is a symbol of a prophet. And what is a prophet but someone who brings forbidden knowledge back from the other side? A prophet might be someone who 
read your palm. A prophet might be someone who uh, can go to sleep like Edgar Casey and go to sleep and tell you of all your past lives, the sleeping prophet, they call him. Someone like Sylvia Brown, who can tell you, you know, that your 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 uh, your your dead aunt is standing right next to you and she's telling you this and that and the other thing. Ravens have been prophets in literature since forever. Um, they're also seen as birds of bad omen. In Sweden, they're the ghosts of murdered people. In Germany, they're the souls of the damned. In Danish folklore, a vowel raven is the raven of the slain. It's a human soul trapped in animal form who can only be released by drinking the blood of a human infant. A vowel raven who ate the heart of a king would acquire human knowledge and gain supernatural powers. Native Americans, the raven is the trickster and creator. A raven created the world by dropping a stone into the ocean. In Germanic or Norse tradition, a raven, uh, actually in, in, in uh, the Vikings, so Hugana and Mugen are two ravens that serve as the eyes of Odin, the, the top god of the Vikings. And every day those ravens would fly into the land of humans. And then every night they would come back to Odin in his realm in Valhalla and uh, bring the news. In Judeo-Christian tradition, Elijah is a prophet and he is fed by ravens in the wilderness. The Muslims, uh, the Quran teaches that Cain and Abel, a raven, I'm sorry, a raven teaches Cain and Abel how to bury the dead. So think about this. Here steps a raven into his chamber and sits. This is the prophet, a sign of a prophet, and sits on top of the head of the goddess of wisdom. Wow. The, the symbol is the most potent thing ever. And so what does he expect to get from this raven? He expects to get knowledge, knowledge. Yeah. And then he says, but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bus spoke only. Uh, so I'm sorry, this much I marveled at this ungainly foul to hear discourse so plainly. Uh, ever yet was birth sculpt. Okay, fine. Uh, on 55, but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bus spoke only that one word. As if it's soul in that one word. He did outpour nothing farther than he fluttered, not a feather than he fluttered. <laughs> Till I scarcely more than muttered. Now here's the, the, the melancholy youth. He says, oh, on the morrow, you will leave me as my hopes have flown before. So that means he, he for just a moment lets himself believe that maybe the raven is here to help. And then he says, other friends have come and tried to help me before and they've all just left me. They just left me and you're going to leave me too. And then the bird said, nevermore. Wow. Going back to line 42, um, the ebony bird beguiling his sad fancy into smiling. He's actually says, man, this is crazy. And he says, though thy crest be shorn and chained thou. So he's saying we're hearkening back to, to the good old days of medieval knights. When a knight, a craven, was a cowardly knight, they would shave his head. And so a raven's head appears to be shaved. And so he says, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, tell me, tell me, tell me, he's just joking with him. He's just joking with him. He says, tell me, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. And this is when the bird actually says, like a parrot, like a parrot, actually says, nevermore. Imagine this. I know you've grown up with this poem. I know you understand that this has been around a long time, but imagine if that really happened. Symbol of a prophet sitting on Athena, the goddess of wisdom's head. I am trying to get over this terrible loss. Here comes this rock. And I ask you, I'm joking with, I'm joking with the, the damn bird. I'm like, I'm like, so, so you're, you're clearly not a cowardly knight, even though your, uh, your crest is short. So tell me what thy lordly name is. Woo, you're so hot. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian chore. And then the bird actually says, nevermore. Wow. 
Okay. And then he thinks, well, maybe you're here to help me. He says, no, this is the main, this is one of the first things that the bird imparts to the, to the melancholy youth. He says, nevermore. On the morrow, you will leave me as my hopes have flown before. So the bird says, no, no, I will never, ever leave you. Never. Okay. And then he's trying to explain it away even more. He says, uh, doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom a merciful disaster followed fast and tell and followed faster till his songs of hope one burden bore. So that's like as if, oh, I get it. Okay, okay. You were the pet of some very, very unhappy person who just walked around all day going, oh, never more. Never more. Never more. Never more. And then finally the bird's like, never more, never more. So I get it. I get it. That must be it. And then he says, wait a minute, I, this, this is just too much. He started almost to laugh. This is just too much. And so he takes a chair and he actually wheels this chair out in front of bird and bust and door. And now all those, think of those signs. Here's this door to the other universe, door to knowledge. Here is Athena, the wisdom, goddess of wisdom. And here is this prophet here who's come in from the Plutonian night to teach me something about the universe, to bring back un unforgiven, to bring back uh, uh, forbidden knowledge from the other side. And he takes, his, he takes a chair and he actually wheels it over and he wheels it up in front and he sits there. He sits there and he says, Upon the velvet sinking, fancy under fancy, I, I began to think what this grim, ungainly, ghostly, gaunt, and ominous bird of your men and croaking, this and more, I sat and, you know, engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burn into my bosom's core. You can just imagine those eyes. You ever had someone who, who keeps eye contact too long? You're like, Damn, man, what's up, dog? Well, it's like it's like that with these birds. They can even move their body in there, right? To the foul, foul whose fiery eyes, fiery hell. That's hell whose fiery eyes now burn in my bosom's core. And then he he leans back on the chair, and he realizes that this velvet violet lining, his love Lenore had pressed once before. She had sat there. She shall press, but whose velvet violet lining? She shall press. Ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser. So he's sad again. He's like, oh, you know, this is all good and everything, but I'm just, I'm just so depressed. Just so depressed. Then methought the air grew denser. Perfume from an unseen censer swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tickled on the tuffy floor. Now there's great alliteration again. <laughs> Here's their little tiptoes. Seraphim are the highest order of angels in the Christian tradition. They are God's right and left hand angels. Seraphim, the most beautiful angels. And so he says to himself, wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent these. By these angels, he has sent thee respite, respite, and nepenthe. Nepenthe is like to become a, a, a remedy. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from the memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff, stop these memories of lost Lenore. So he says, I get it. I get it. You're not, you said you're never going to leave me. That's wonderful. And you're here. You were sent by these angels. And these angels sent you here so that I can forget about Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. I will never leave you. And I'm not here to help you forget about Lenore. Damn. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Prophet said I. All right. There it is. This is the first line that he wrote of the whole poem. This right here. Prophet said I. Thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. He says, I don't care. Look, I mean, you're clearly a prophet. We know this. You are here to tell me something. I know this. So, and, and at this point, at this point, he's all in. At this point, he's all in. He really believes it. 
He really believes what is occurring. He's not, there's no more joking anymore. There's no more joking. It has, it has fallen as deeply and as seriously as it could possibly fall. He, the joking's over. He says, okay, you are never going to leave me and you're not here to help me forget about Lenore. You must be here to deliver a message. Prophet, prophet said I, whether you're a bird or a devil, you're still a prophet. So tell me whether 10% or tempest tossed, <laughs> all that alliteration, 10% tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me truly I implore. That is effectively to ask him, Gilead is this biblical allusion to where there was a, an elixir in Gilead, and it's a balm that would heal any ailment you had. So he says, effectively, he asked the bird, he says, prophet, it doesn't matter if you're devil or angel or just a bird, you're still a prophet. Tell me, give me this one thing. Is there anything on earth, anything in this life that will make me feel better? Is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. And the bird said, no, never more. I'm not, I will never leave you. I'm not here to help you forget about Lenore. And there is nothing on earth that will help you. Wow, this has gone from bad to worse to even worse. And then he says, prophet said, I thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels lay in the north. So he says, okay, I get it. I'm doomed. It's about what I thought. But just tell me, just tell me this one thing. Is Lenore at least, is Lenore in heaven? If within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Tell me, tell me truly, I implore. And the raven says, nevermore. Nope. Lenore's not in heaven. She's not there. And there's probably no heaven. It's probably nothing. Just like when you look through that door a minute ago, it was darkness. That's what you're going to, that's what you got to look forward to. That's where Lenore is. She's obliterated. She's oblivious. She's in the oblivion. She's not in heaven. She's not experiencing joy. She's experiencing nothingness like my feathers, like my, the darkness that you see through that door. Lenore is not in heaven. I am not here. I will never leave you. I'm not here to make you forget about Lenore. There's nothing on earth that will help you feel better in any kind of way. And Lenore's not in heaven. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. No, I already told you, buddy, I'm not going to leave you ever. <laughs> and so the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust of Paulus just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming and the demons that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. Nevermore. He says, and the bird, in a metaphorical way, of course, the bird is always there, always right there in my mind, always there to remind me, I'll never leave you. I'm not here to help you forget. You will always remember. There's nothing on earth that will help you. And Lenore's not in heaven. In fact, there's no heaven. It's oblivion, blackness, darkness, endless misery.
and I'll always be here. It's always there to show. And so he says, and my soul from out that shadow. And of course, a shadow is a metaphor in itself that lies floating on the floor, just like the ghosts of the embers in the beginning shall be lifted nevermore. Wow. It's pretty dark. It's pretty dark. It's a triumph. It, it is. It is. I think one of the greatest poems. I call it the. Uh, I call it the uh, gateway drug to literature. <laughs> you, you get hooked on this, and then you fall in deeper. But it is, in some to some degree, that the the, uh, the melancholy youth, the student, who whatever you want to call him, has set himself up by asking, he knows the bird's going to say nevermore, but he's asking him these questions that the answer just makes it even more horrible. And I think if you've ever had your heart broken, if you've ever dealt with a tragedy, something really, really desperately bad, you feel these feelings. You feel as if your soul is stuck in some kind of a shadow you feel like you're walking outside, everybody else is skipping along and having a good day. Hi, everybody. And you have this black cloud following you just everywhere you go, right? Why is it that they all feel happiness and joy? And I feel such terror and horribleness and pain and sorrow all the time. This structure of the poem, it, it has this internal rhyme once upon a midnight dreary while i pondered weak and weary so it has an internal rhyme on the first and third lines and then that really gets this rhythm rolling and all of the different image images and all of the different symbols it, it really makes it just one of the most perfect poems that I've that I've ever taught that I've ever read the dark romantics are Poe Hawthorne and Melville and they're certainly my favorite and the reason is because they are I mean it, it is hard Poe said something to the effect of I can't I can't bring up the passions from a bubbling brook Whereas these early romantics, they're like, oh, look, there's a duck. Let me, let me write a poem about the duck and how, and how the duck is going to lead my way through life. And I'm going to be so... <laughs> Poe, and, and all of them to some degree, Poe said, I can't, that's not, I can't do that. I have to have this darkness. So they felt like, they felt like the early romantics were, were superficial. Yeah. Superficial. For them, now remember we have the, um, the Puritans say we're dark, we're evil. The neoclassicists say that we are good. Yeah, we're good. Early Romantics say we're good. The later the transcendentalists will say we're God. But the dark Romantics, they say we exist in some kind of a wild state you know, with, with a riding the fence between good and evil, that if you're Melville, I'm sorry, if you're, uh, if you're Nathaniel Hawthorne, you would say that we all have this black streak running through us. And that goes back to maybe Carl Jung and his, and his shadow self. Yeah. You have, you ever do something really horrible? It says, Sean Appel, what the hell? Why did you do that? You did that's not you. Your shadow comes out. We are not ideal creatures. We're born neither good nor evil, but we have some, we're in some wild state, but we, but we have this tendency towards evil. We have this tendency towards evil. And as I said before, we are, we are seeking the sublime. And if you can see in the raven, the sublime, we have every example of the sublime in the raven. Now, this is a sublime thing, right? I mean, if it really happened, if it really happened to you, it would be a trip, right? Sublime, man. It's just, it's, it inspires awe. It's awe, right? And they have this idea of mysticism, the dark romantics. Mysticism, mysticism. Mysticism is just what a prophet does. 
It's a, mysticism is the idea that you can bring back forbidden knowledge from the other side. Mysticism, a mystic. A mystic is like a fortune teller, a soothsayer, a shaman. And they're somehow able to travel to the other world, assuming there is one, and bring back knowledge. People do it in all different kind of ways, mystics. Some are, some takes peyote. I don't know. If you're interested, you can watch a documentary about, it's called the God, the God particle. No, no, the, the God molecule, something like that. It's about DMT. And DMT is the substance we all have in our brains that apparently, I'm not a, a doctor, but apparently it, it is um, released at the time of your birth and at the time of your death. People take this stuff. It's supremely psychedelic. And they take this stuff and they go on 15 minute journeys that are like lifetimes for themselves. And they say they literally see God. Now, that doesn't mean I want you to try it. No way, no way, man, no way. But people use drugs to try to find the other side, peyote, LSD. People use pain. You've seen the Indians who raise themselves up on those hooks, you know, just, just the idea is to break free from your senses to where you go to some other place. There was a Catholic priest, I'm sorry, a Catholic uh, nun who drank the bath water of lepers to try to come closer to God. Um, in any event, people do it in all different kinds of ways. Some people try to enter a flow state. Some people are meditators. They meditate. They, they find it through meditation. But these dark, 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 dark feelings that we have, sadness, anxiety, depression, anger, revenge, monomania, all these things, those are the things that create, that move us closer, they say, the dark romantics say, move us closer to this sublimity, to the other side. Right? This is Poe Hawthorne and Melville. 